Now, the moon is only a half a degree across, right? And so this is pretty close. That's a pretty good alignment. You look at Mars. Mars was at 245.6 degrees off from the sun. It was supposed to be at 240 to be perfect, so it's, it's off by 5.5 degrees. That's not bad. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll give them that one. I'll, I'll let that one slide under the, under the carpet. Jupiter was at about 62 degrees, where it should have been at 60. Saturn at 123.2, it should have been 120. And here we go, a little old Chiron here at 298.2 degrees when it should have been at 300. That's not really so bad. Okay, and then I thought to myself, golly, though, this is just measured along a line as if, as if um, these things are perfectly aligned. But, you know, maybe, maybe one of these things is up over here. It's still 60 degrees this way, but you have to go up. So I checked that, and it turns out that things are still close, but not quite as good. I mean, Chiron is now off by 6.5 degrees. These things are all... You know, you're talking, you're talking this way in the sky versus this way. It's, it's actually what's called ecliptic longitude versus ecliptic latitude, just to throw some terms out to make you think I know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, and again, you know, it's, 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 only, it's not that much worse than the first chart. So again, you know, it's like, well, it's not perfect. I'm willing to give them the benefit of a doubt. And as a matter of fact, the first time I did this, I screwed it up. And I got Chiron being like 40 degrees off. And I thought, wow, I've really got them on this. And then some, I put this up on my web page, and somebody emailed me and said, that's not right. It should only be about six. And then I went back and realized I had dropped a minus sign when I was cutting and pasting stuff. So debunking this stuff is, is, can be, you got to be careful. Um, so anyway, this is still not bad. But then I thought, no, well, now wait a second. Okay, that's only, you know, left and right on the sky and up and down, if you want to call it that way. But there's also sort of an in and out. You know, these objects aren't necessarily the same distances. Well, let's find out how far away these objects are on the evening of November 8th. And you can see that the sun is, is, is as usual, about 150 million kilometers away. It's about 90 million miles. The moon is very close, 400,000 kilometers, or about 200 and something thousand miles. Mars was actually very close to the Earth. As you might remember, in August, Mars was very close to the Earth. I could hold a whole, a whole other talk about that whole, that whole stuff. Jupiter was 870 million kilometers away. Saturn's starting to push the envelope at 1.3 billion kilometers. But then look at Chiron. 1.9 billion kilometers away. You know, that, that's a long way off. It's over a billion miles away. Now, mind you, this is not some mighty star or giant planet. This is an ice cube, okay, <laughs> floating out there that is, that is a 10,000th as bright as you can see with the eye. You, you can't even see this with a good telescope. I mean, you would need a pretty serious telescope to be able to see this thing at all. But, of course, people coming into my website, and this is on my website, who might tend to believe in astrology may not really want to see numbers. So I have a little pretty picture I put together that actually shows, you know, thank heavens for Julia. You know? Um, I didn't think I would need her sympathy laughter as maybe some other people have this morning. But um, it's nice to know it's there as a backup. But here's, here's actually a chart of the solar system at that time. Um, here's the sun and the earth and Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Chiron's down here. On this scale, this, and this is, this is one of the things about astronomy that's tough. If you want to see things that are kind of close in and things that are really far away at the same time, it's almost impossible. Chiron is so frickin' far away, okay, that I can't even show you how close the moon is to the Earth on this scale. It actually, it's overlapping the Earth. So let me connect these for you and show you this wonderful hexagram in the sky <laughs> that looks, you know, I don't know, like a, a bird. What do you guys see in here? Do you see the face of, uh, of Lennon or Randy? I don't, I don't see anything. Okay, I mean, this is, this is so bad that I can't even say it looks like, you know, anything. Looks like how? Quick, think of a joke. No, I can't. Okay. A martini glass. And we are in Vegas. And Dean Martin did play in Vegas. Coincidence? Yeah, probably. But I, I just think that's funny. I mean, these guys were claiming this is a, it's a perfect hexagram in the sky. And it's like, well, it's not perfect, but it's okay. And, I mean, you saw that chart, right, where they, they plot the Earth in the center, and they assume that these things are all at the same distance. And, and, and clearly that's not the case. And this is actually at the core of why astrology is wrong. They say that something like Jupiter has the same effect on you as the sun does, as the moon does. And I keep thinking, but these things are all at different distances. Jupiter has 300 times the mass of the Earth. And the Earth has 80 times the mass of the moon. And if that's right, I think that's a factor of, means that Jupiter is 24,000 times the mass of the, of the moon. I mean, that's a huge factor. Why is it that Jupiter and the moon have the same amount of effect on you when one is really far away and far more massive? And, and then, so if you read this website, and the guy says, well, you know, Chiron is, is small and it is far away, but it's, it's a transitional symbol between the here and now and the, the, I guess, the there and then, I guess, I don't know. And so, 
you know, this was very important because it's the last object in here and it's transitioning all this, the, the metaphysical quantum hydrodynamics of the, of the you know, whew, silliness. And, and, and it, this is great because what these guys wanted to do, and this really killed me, is they wanted to get 144,000 people together. And at the moment of the eclipse, and there was a lunar eclipse at this time, because when the moon is opposite the sun, right, you get a lunar eclipse. And this, this is what made this so special. That during the lunar eclipse, they wanted to get 144,000 people together, um, which I, I find a little gross, but... Um, <laughs> And, and they were all going to sit and chant, Om, okay? And um, they did this, okay, in November. And they did this to raise uh, uh, the consciousness, to, to, bring, to make everybody more enlightened. And, and I'm sure you all felt this last November um, when this happened. And I'm thinking, you know, gosh, nothing bad has happened since then. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't think it worked very well. And actually, I talked about this on... On the radio, I was interviewed on a, on a radio show about this Coast to Coast AM, which is a pretty big chucklehead woo-woo out there radio show. And I like to go on it because, you know, you listen to the show and, and every, you know, once a month or something, they'll have an actual scientist saying something that actually might be real a instead of, you know, ghost voices and, and, and UFOs and all this kind of stuff. And I was talking about this and, and the host was really trying to get me to say, you know, well, don't you think this does any good? And I said, no. And he said, why not? And I said, because these people are sitting on their asses chanting, oh, okay. Get up and do something good. Like, oh, look, litter. Pick it up and throw it away. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and we went on about this for a while. He said, well, you know, what could they do? And I said, they could vote. You know, if you want to make change in life, chanting Ohm is not the way to do it. And um, it was funny because we were, we were talking about the collective unconscious and I said, there's no evidence for this. And we started talking about the paranormal and I, 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 think, I think it was Michael who said that there's no such thing as the paranormal. And I love the fact that that slide was up because I said that on the radio. I said, there's no such thing as the paranormal. And the host said, what do you mean? And I said, because things are either normal or not, okay? They exist or they don't. If there are ghosts, then there's a reason for them. And so, you know, it's not paranormal if there's a scientific explanation, if there are in fact ghosts. Um, and he didn't care for that explanation very much. Um, okay, so astrology. Okay, astrology isn't real science. Um, but there are some other things going on. Um, speaking of Jupiter, as I was a moment ago, um, last uh, September, the Galileo space probe ended its mission, which was an extraordinary mission of orbiting Jupiter for many years. It dropped a probe into Jupiter to, to look at the, the weather on, on the planet, orbited Jupiter, took images of its moons, all sorts of, uh, of data came back. We learned a huge amount about this planet. Galileo was an awesome, awesome probe, even though it was slightly damaged. The antenna got broken, and it couldn't return images as well as like the Voyager probes could. Or the Cassini probe will, which is on its way to Saturn. It'll be there November this year. And I promise you, if this works, those are going to be life-changing pictures of Saturn. It's already produced images of Saturn, which are just fantastic. Go on the web and find them. You believe me, you'll, you'll be happy. Um, but since Gal the Galileo probe um, orbited Jupiter for a long time, and um, one of its missions was to study the moons, and one of these moons was Europa. And Europa has a shell of ice around it, and there's evidence that um, there's a liquid water ocean underneath this, this ice. And it's, it's being heated by all sorts of complicated physical forces, <clears throat> but there does seem to be a lot of liquid water on there. And if there's liquid water, there is a potential for life. Personally, I don't give it very high odds. On the other hand, you really want to screw this up. And so NASA said, you know what? We're out of fuel on Galileo. We're running out of funds to keep it going. Um, it's going to keep orbiting Jupiter for a long time. It might accidentally hit Europa and contaminate it. You know, it doesn't take that much effort to just drop the probe into Jupiter with the last bit of the fuel, let it burn up, and it's, it's out of our hair and we're done. You know, maybe that wasn't the best decision. Maybe they could, maybe money would come up, maybe, you know, whatever. But that's, that's what NASA wanted to do. And so that's what they did. Um, well, this got latched onto by, by a lot of people. And um, what happened is that, um, I know, Galileo, when you're that far from the sun, solar panels uh, are not efficient enough to generate the kind of energy you need to keep the probe running and to be able to send images back. So typically what um, space agency has done, what NASA has done and, and, uh, and other space agencies, is they use what are called radiothermal generators, These are radioisotope thermal generators. These are, uh, here's one here. Um, this is a, I'm sorry, the, the best picture I found was actually in German. So this is actually the radioisotope battery. 
And since I am from California, I can talk this way, yeah, okay. 